Linda Pipkin and others uh, versus Daryl Acumen, uh, case one eight zero seven zero zero nine four eight. Excuse me one second. Can we have appearances for the record, please. Seth Meets for plaintiffs. Okay. Todd Weiler for defendant Daryl Acumen. I have with me Kennedy Starr. She's my intern. Student at the U wants to maybe go to law school, so she's just observing today. All right. Any objection to the intern sitting here? Nope. Okay. Thank you. All right. This is time set for argument on the uh, motion to dismiss. I have a preliminary question for you both. Procedural one. I'd like you to think about. Um, Rule 12B says that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, if on a motion asserting the defense number six, which is failure to state a claim, um, matters outside the pleading are presented to and not excluded by the court, the motion shall be treated as one for summary judgment and disposed of as provided in Rule 56, and all parties shall be given reasonable opportunity to present all material uh, made per pertinent to such motion by Rule 56. I've certainly been presented with matters outside um, of the pleadings um, by the motion. Um, so I guess I'm looking for comment from both of you as to whether we should convert this to a Rule 56, a, a summary judgment motion, and afford the opportunity to have uh, additional affidavits or material presented uh, under Rule 7, uh, 12B. So I'm not sure who wants to talk first, but uh, any thoughts on that? I guess really it boils down to Mr. Needs. Does your client feel the need to submit <coughs> by affidavit additional materials outside the pleadings to uh, in response to the materials that were presented by Mr. Weiler's client? Um, on first thought, I, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's necessary on first thought. Um, I can't think of anything in there that would now, on a summary judgment motion, you know, you, you my, my, my first, my, my first assumption is, or my first thought is no, I, I can't think of anything that would, um, in there that would make that necessary. Um, I guess the question is, do you wish to contradict any of the factual actual statements made by the defendant in his affidavit? I, I mean, if, if it's going to if it's going to be treated as a summary judgment motion, probably would need to contradict some of those. But but it's it's been a while since I've looked at all of that. But I but yes, pr probably if if it's going to be if I need to contradict some of that, probably yeah, I did. Probably want to write an affidavit or or, or uh, contradict some of that. Yes. If I could, Your Honor, Mr. Um, Wilder. So, um, first of all, it wasn't my intent to convert it, but I'm not opposed to converting it. But second of all, I just want to point out, uh, we filed the motion, and the memo, and the affidavit. Um, uh, the defense, the, the plaintiffs, then had an opportunity to file an opposition and any affidavits at that point. Um, and then we filed a reply with no new affidavit. So to the extent that Mr. You know, the plaintiffs or their counsel feels like it was necessary to file an affidavit now, the affidavit was filed with the original motion, and they had an opportunity. They could have filed, they could have each filed an affidavit with their opposition had they chosen to do so. Um, this, at this point, seems like a little bit of a second bite of the apple. So we, if we had filed an affidavit with our reply, I think we would have opened the door uh, but that was not the case in this in these proceedings. Any further comment, Mr. Needs? So the 
if I'd have to relook at the rule, but with that rule, is should, does it need to be stated in the in the motion that it's it's a summary judgment motion? Or no, it automatically just, you know, the rule says, and I, here's a copy if you want it. Yeah. The rule says, if on a motion asserting the defense number six to dismiss for failure of the pleading to state a claim upon which relief can be granted, matters outside the pleading are presented to and not excluded by the court, the motion shall be treated as one for summary judgment and disposed of as provided in Rule 56. It, it, interestingly, it doesn't say may be treated. It says the motion shall be treated as one for summary judgment. Now, there certainly, again, there certainly were matters outside the pleading that were presented. So the first part of it is, uh, is satisfied. I was not asked, at least not in your pleadings, to exclude any of those matters. Right. Uh, and so um, it says the motion shall be treated. What it affects, of course, is, is the standard yeah. of review. I mean, on a motion to dismiss, I accept the statements made in the complaint as true. On a motion for summary judgment, I don't. The motion for summary judgment, you're stuck with. I mean, you have to. Well, I have to look at the affidavits that are submitted and see if there are any uh, material disputes of facts presented by those affidavits to see if the uh, matter survives summary judgment. Uh, so it's a it's, it's a different it's an entirely different standard. And so the question is, uh, what standard applies here? Uh, the, the rule then goes on to the state, all parties shall be given a reasonable opportunity to present all material made pursuant, pertinent to such a motion by Rule 56. So I, 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 I'm not sure, Mr. Weiler, that the fact that it wasn't initially addressed, other than the fact that there was no request made to exclude the materials, really fall, you know, plays into this. Uh, if it's going to be treated as a motion for summary judgment, I think I need to give both sides, it's, and it says both sides, all parties, reasonable opportunity to present all material made pertinent to such a motion. Um, so that's, the, that's kind of the dilemma I, I find myself in. Do I treat this as a motion for summary judgment? And I think I have to under the rule because there are motions there certainly is a lot of material that's been uh, submitted that's outside the pleadings. Your Honor, what, what if um, we argue the legal issues today, Mr. Needs had, you know, a short time period to file any supplemental affidavits and then we submit it, you know, with the affidavits without, I, I don't know that I would have anything further to say, so. Mr. Needs? So you're suggesting argue the legal issues today, uh, okay. the merits. Gotcha. Okay. And then you'd have a short time, I don't know, a week or two, whatever the judge sets to submit. Okay. Any. And I don't know. I don't know if additional affidavits would actually present. I mean, clearly there are a lot of what I would call pure legal issues that are at play here. Uh, I don't know if if additional affidavits would really present additional. I, I just don't know because I don't know what the affidavits would say. I guess okay. is what I'm saying. Yeah, that sounds fair. That sounds fair to me. And there's, you know, again, just having read your materials, you know, there are certainly some areas that you disagree with each other factually. I'm not sure how important they are to the resolution of the matter. You know, just off the top of my head, one of them has to do with, you know, the extent of the distribution of the email, whether it was at 400000 or was it 67000 or something. I'm not sure that matters, but I'm saying there are clearly some factual disputes that I suspect we would have um, after I heard, after I saw an affidavit from your side, whether those would ultimately, at the end of the day, um, have a material impact on, on the court's ruling, I don't know, because I don't know what the rest of it might say. Uh, do you want to go ahead and argue today? I'm happy to hear argument today, and then you can supplement it with whatever you wish you, you need to. Yeah, that, that, that sounds fair to me. Yeah, that works. Okay. 
All right, let's go ahead and then, Mr. Weiler, it's your motion. <coughs> Thank you, Your Honor. And um, I'd like to kind of just uh, put this in context because um, I, I believe that if the court were to adopt the uh, plaintiff's theory of the case that every time an organization emailed its members and said, hey, uh, Congress is debating this issue, please contract your, your congressman, or the state legislature is debating this issue, please contact your state legislator and ask them to vote no, or to vote yes, under, under the plaintiff's theory of the case, that would constitute electronic harassment. And, and I would just submit to the court that that is un-American, and it's certainly not <laughs> It's certainly not uh, what the statute says, and it certainly wasn't uh, it wasn't intended to uh, stifle uh, political speech in this country. And the reason I say that, Your Honor, is because the State Central Committee, while it is the governing body of a private organization, a political association, the Utah Republican Party, it acts in a very similar representative fashion as Congress does to the United States or to the, as the legislature does to a state. And I just want to briefly walk, um, uh, without objection, the court through that process. So every one of these plaintiffs, they went to a precinct caucus, and they stood up in front of their neighbors, and they said, elect me, and I'll represent our neighborhood to a county or state convention. Um, and they, got, they ran, they usually typically give speeches, and they, get, they got elected. And then they went to that county convention, county political convention, and they stood up among the hundreds of other delegates who were elected at their precincts, caucuses, and they said, they gave another speech, and they said, elect me, and I'll go, and I'll serve on the state central committee, and I'll represent the whole county on the state central committee, the governing body of this party, and I'll make sure that we're, we're doing our jobs. And then, as members of the state central committee, they, uh, they, they voted for and supported, voted for or supported uh, a process that would have affected how uh, that political party's candidates would appear on the ballot. And so uh, Daryl Ackerman was one of these uh, members, defendant was one of these members. He had been elected as a delegate. He had been elected uh, from his county political party to the state central committee. He saw something going on that he objected to. And as a delegate, he, 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 he wanted a wider um, b membership of the party, the people that weren't invited to these meetings, the people that didn't, weren't necessarily paying attention to know, hey, there's something going on here that could negatively affect our organization. Our, and, 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 and in his email, if you read it, which I included in the affidavit, which was conveniently left out of the complaint, he said, here's the purposes of the party. It, the purpose of the party is to nominate candidates. They're, these This group of people is trying to change that process, and they're doing it in a way that could strip us of our our entire purpose. We could have candidates who are, are not certified with our political party on the ballot. And, and he was a whistleblower, uh, Your Honor. He was a whistleblower saying, are you aware of what's going on right now in our in, in, with these people? And if you agree with me, I want you to email them and tell them that you don't agree. That's exactly what he did. And I will submit to the court that this type of email uh, maybe with a little bit less uh, aggressive language, goes out on a daily basis based on what state legislatures are doing, based on what federal legislatures are doing, all across the nation. And it's part of our uh, democracy. It's part of our uh, constitutional republic, if you will. And, um, and, and you know, we, we are in a kind of a golden age of technology where, you know, instead of getting out a paper and pencil and writing your congressman and licking the envelope, you know, you just hit send. And you can, you can <laughs> email a lot of people when you hit send. But, um, and, and again, the, 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 the people who went and told their neighborhood and then told their whole county, I want to represent you, they got a couple hundred emails in response, and now they're claiming damages. Um, and, and I can tell you, uh, and I have very good first-hand knowledge, that state legislators get hundreds of emails every single day from the people they represent. And I've never seen one of them um, uh, allege that somehow a law has been broken, um, or that their um, lives have been disrupted, or they've suffered some type of uh, emotional damages because the people that they were elected to represent are now speaking out to them and saying, 
um, we don't want you to vote this way or we want you to undo something like that. That's exactly what happened here. And while this is not under the cloth of government, if you read our state code or Title 20A of the Utah Code, the political parties have an uh, a, a, a very important role in the primary and the, and the candidate nomination process. So that this is a very important backdrop um, for the court to consider a defamation claim and to consider an electronic harassment um, claim and also to consider a false light claim, which has kind of an element of privacy inherent in that claim. Um, and I, I would say that when you stand up and, and you say elect me to represent thousands of people, uh, you've kind of mounted that bully pulpit and then for you to come back and say, oh, my privacy was violated in some respect, um, that, that, that I think falls short of any applicable legal standards. So as a backdrop, uh, I wanted to give the court that context. And then um, obviously, you know, many of these claims hinge on defamation and every Every first year law school student knows that uh, truth is an absolute defense to defamation. And the reason we've, uh, I've, I've uh, outlined in, in, in both the memorandum and the reply memorandum, given the court citations, not only to the Utah Supreme Court, but not only to uh, just, uh, Judge Newfer in the U U.S. District Court in two decisions, but also to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, all of these courts have found uh, that Senate Bill 54 uh, mandates a signature path uh, if, a, if a party has elected to operate for that election cycle as a QPP or a qualified political party. And just so we're clear, under the law, uh, and this is all enshrined in the Utah Code, uh, each election cycle, a political party in Utah can, can choose to be an RPP, uh, a registered political party, or a QPP, a qualified political party, or they could just they have other options, and Judge Newfer, I think, articulated this in some of his earlier decisions that they could just have their candidates run and appear on. They could have their candidates run as write-ins and then tell all their members, "Hey, th this guy, he's, he doesn't say any, his our party next to his name, but he's our guy." They could run newspaper ads. They could send out emails. There are about five different paths to the ballot, but the Utah Republican Party. Um, for the, re the relevant election cycle, they certified to the state months before this, this bylaw, we're going to operate this cycle as a qualified political party. And the law says if you choose to operate as a qualified political party, you have to allow your candidates to choose a signature path or the caucus convention path or both. And the, the question that was certified by the, the, by the district court to the Utah Supreme Court is, is it really the candidate that gets to ch decide the path, or is it the party under the law? Because uh, some people claim there was some ambiguity in the law, which, fr quite frankly, I never saw. But the Utah Supreme Court came back and said, no, it's the candidate that chooses. So w with all of those court decisions um, uh, ferreted out, and, 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 and I can tell you the State Central Committee usually has a a lawyer there answering questions, and, and they have at several of these meetings that, that are issued in this lawsuit. Uh, a plan was devised, and this was articulated in, in, um, in some of the media accounts that uh, Mr. Acumen attached to his declaration. Hey, well, if we, if we pass this, maybe we can tee up um, a third lawsuit. There's already been two that we've lost, but maybe we can tee up a third lawsuit. Maybe finally the courts will see everything in this way. And, Your Honor, if there is a, uh, if there is a plan to violate the law, and to do so in a, you know, in, in a public uh, election process, um, that, that by definition would be illegal. Uh, it may not be a criminal act per se, uh, but it would be illegal. So for, for someone uh, to email out members of the association that, 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 that he's been elected to represent and say, hey, I think our colleagues are trying to do something illegal. Uh, it's against the law. It's against this law <laughs> that, that we've had a Utah Supreme Court decision on and, and federal court decisions on. And I think this is a mistake for our party. I think this could have negative consequences on our candidates. And I want you to, if you agree with me, I want you to reach out and, and contact them. That, that's exactly what Mr. Ac Acumen did. Um, and, and he was a bit abrupt and terse in his language. But, um, if truth is an absolute defense, I would say I would submit to the court that the that the legal decisions interpreting Senate Bill 54, which I have provided in the briefs, um, shows that Mr. Acumen was correct that that bylaw was in violation of the law. In fact, I would submit, according to the Utah policy argument, that that bylaw was actually intended to be illegal uh, to tee up uh, an additional lawsuit, and so that does not give claim uh, for a defamation claim. Uh, and um, if the court 
rejects that notion and says no, that that bylaw wasn't illegal or that attempt uh, was not illegal, then there are other uh, qualified privileges um, under, under state law for defamation that, that would apply. And one of those is the um, common interest exception. And so one of the legal disputes we have is um, I'm saying, and, and the email, the email that Mr. Ackerman sent said, here is our, here is the purpose of our party. And, and he, 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 he sets it out in the email. And, um, and this would, would violate that. Um, and then the, the plaintiffs come back and say, well, because this isn't a business, then you can't use that exception. He cites no authority. And, and in fact, uh, the Utah Republican Party is uh, registered with the Utah Department of Commerce as a political association. Um, I'm not sure how you draw that line. Um, it, 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 it has a lease. It has employees. Uh, it, it uh, you know, uh, if it's not a business, and, and again, that we don't have any cases saying that this wouldn't apply to a, a political business, if you would, uh, but the business of the Republican Party, the, of this political association registered with the state, is to nominate candidates so that their names can appear on the ballot uh, for the general elections. And so um, I, I think that is, uh, that is a, a legal question for the court, and there's no, there's no authority cited uh, by the a counsel for the plaintiffs um, uh, arguing or, or showing that, that, this, that this qualified privilege would not apply to these circumstances. Um, the um, Electronic Communications Harassment Statute, Utah Code Annotated 76-9-20, um, uh, I will concede that an email was used. Um, so to, to the extent that, uh, that there was an electronic communication, um, that, that is absolutely correct. But that also, uh, Section 4B of that statute says it does not create any civil cause of action based on uh, electronic communication made for a legitimate business purpose. And I would ask the court, um, once a, a delegate is elected to, to represent their precinct, or once a, a delegate is elected to represent their entire county, how else would they communicate with the thousands of people that they've been elected to represent uh, but for email? I mean, are they going? Are they supposed to handwrite letters to everyone that they represent so that uh, they they wouldn't come into uh, uh, maybe a violation of this law? And and what would be the purpose of uh, of them communicating with the people that they've been elected to represent if it wasn't to tell them what was happening at the party level and 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 what action they could take to maybe prevent some uh, terrible consequences from coming to fruition? And so. Uh, also, in the electronic communication statute, uh, we can see that the intent of the law is to, uh, to protect personal identifying information, which is defined as name, birth date, address, telephone, driver's license, social security number, uh, and, and none of those things were communicated by Mr. Ackerman to the people that he emailed, whether it was 67,000 or 400,000 or 400 million. None of that information. We now have the email before the court, and uh, the plaintiffs uh, have even filed an amended complaint, including the email after I pointed out that it had been excluded uh, from their initial uh, pleadings. So, um, and further, the um, electronic um, communications uh, harassment statute requires repeated contact um, by the plaintiff. Um, in this instance, uh, the plaintiff did not email any of the defendants a hundred times. Uh, what happened was the people that they were elected to represent, the people that they stood up and said, if you elect me, I'll represent you on the State Central Committee, those very constituents, political constituents, they were emailing their representatives on the State Central Committee and saying, don't do this, please reverse this action. So now they are trying to bootstrap the fact that Mr. Acumen, as a whistleblower, that he alerted a wider section of the party other than these 51 individuals, of what their intents were, what their actions were. Now those constituents are emailing uh, plaintiffs saying, uh, knock it off, or, or undo this, or we don't, we don't agree with this methodology. And now they want the court to extrapolate those emails and say that Mr. Acumen somehow stepped into their shoes and he was the one causing their inbox uh, to get full. And I would submit, Your Honor, if if any one of these plaintiffs didn't want to hear from the people they represented, they could have either not run as a delegate or not run as a member uh, of the State Central Committee when they went to their county convention. Um, but once that they mounted that bully pulpit, they have opened themselves up to actually hearing from the very people that they, uh, they asked to, to have the privilege of representing. And that is not, uh, that is not harassment 
to hear from the people you represent, that's not harassment under Utah law, and it never should be. And I think it would be un-American if, if it ever was determined to be. Um, the false light um, claims, uh, they, they fall squarely under um, defamation. They're, they're just a subset of defamation. I think I've, I've covered that um, pretty thoroughly, both in the, in the briefing as well as in this oral argument. Um, and um, I, I, the, the thing I haven't covered um, is a statement of opinion. Uh, I cited the, um, the Brennehy versus Nordstrom, if I'm pronouncing that right, um, regarding uh, truth being an absolute defense. Uh, but we, we also know that uh, opinions are, are not considered um, defamation either. And I, I do think, um, uh, based on the re a reasonable reading of the, of the federal court and the Utah Supreme Court's uh, rulings on Senate Bill 54, and the very fact that the media, not, not just one media outlet, but multiple media outlets, were, were, were drawing the same conclusions, the same opinions that were reflected in Mr. Acumen's uh, email, uh, I think shows that uh, that opinion was not uh, reckless or, or, um, or, or without merit. On the, the statement of intentional infliction of emotional distress, um, I, I would submit that actually hearing from the people that you asked to represent uh, is not outrageous or intolerable. Uh, and um, um, if, uh, if there was, I mean, we would obviously have to conduct a discovery uh, on the severeness of their emotional distress of actually receiving emails from the people that they were representing. But I would submit that, uh, that, that, that those claims are, are frivolous and, uh, and should be dismissed with the rest of them. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Right, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Mr. Needs? So I'll, I'll uh, do you have any questions for me before I offer a few uh, thoughts? Oh, I probably will, but go okay, ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I, think the, I think the first thing I'll respond to is, one, what was stated, what, what the defendant stated in the, in the beginning of his remarks, basically that every time an organization says something, they may be you know, liable for electronic communication harassment. I think, I think that's not telling the whole story because when you look at the actual in, actual statute, it says, if with, with, if with the intent to intimidate, abuse, threaten, or disrupt the electronic communications of another person, the person causes jamming or electronic communications or excessive message and, and so forth. So I think, the, I think the importance is the intent. And, it, and, it, and, not, and so not every organization, because they're you know, sending out emails, you know, expressing opinions on things, doesn't mean they have the intent to cause her, you know, harassment to somebody. And I think that's a major, I think that's an important factor to look at in this case. And, and just looking at the statute, that's what it says. Um, a couple other points with the electronic, communica electronic communication harassment uh, statute or, or, or um, cause of action. So what, one, of the, one of the points the defendant makes is that he, he did it for a legitimate business purpose. And, and it's true, when you look at the case law and when you look at the, um, uh, the statute, there's really nothing that defines what that means, what a legitimate business purpose means. And so I, I, would, I would, based on that, you, I would say you have to look at the plain meaning of a legitimate business purpose. And when you look at the definition of a legit, you, know, you, you can ask two questions. One, was the communication, was that legitimate? And two, was it for a business purpose? And when you look at the definition of legitimate, legitimate means was it, was it lawful? And I would say no, that that communication was not, was not lawful because it was defamation. When you look at defamation, there, there's a, defamation is against the law in Utah. So your electronic harassment claim is just derivative of your defamation claim? Yeah. Like I, if, I, one I, fall, if one falls, the other does? I, you know, I, uh, <coughs> I would, uh, not necessarily because, because when, so, because there's two questions you have to ask. One, is it legitimate? And so if it's, so you have to, you have to answer yes to both, to both questions. One, was it legitimate? And I would say no, based on the defamation aspect of it. The second part, was it for a business purpose? And if you look at, if you look at Black's Law, if you look under Black's Law Dictionary, you know, what does, what Well, does, but the way you've stated it, you'd need to actually establish both. So well, the, if, it, if it was legitimate, I mean, it, uh, 
Well, I, I, I would say... If it was, was legitimate, uh, okay, go ahead. Well, yeah. I, 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 would, I would say the defendant has to answer both, yes, to both of those. Okay. And so if he can answer both to yes, it was legitimate, and yes, it was a business, then yeah, yeah. I, I would say, you know, he, he would have that. But it'd have to be both to meet that definition, in, in my opinion. Um, but but if, you look at, if you look at a business purpose, uh, if, if you look at what the definition of business is, I, I think the, uh, the Black's Law definition of business is that which occupies the time, attention, and labor of men for the purpose of livelihood or profit. And when you look at the email, that was not for his business, and this is alleged in the complaint. It was not Does for that him. definition make sense in the context of a political party? I I think so because I think I think what the I think what the So you're you're basically saying there's no political party that's organized they're just not businesses. Yeah, well, I, I, I would now, say... I guess what I'm saying is yeah. you're suggesting that the term business only applies to what I might call a commercial business. That or... Or... Or, uh, or, or possibly, you know, your, your, your livelihood or, or something... I, I think I think that's why it was stated. I think that's why. I mean, if you look at the plain meaning of the statute, and there really is nothing to define it. I think, I think, I think it does really relate to, to businesses or organizations who are involved in things. So if you're doing that as part of your business or as part of your your, your particular organization to get the word out on a particular thing, then I, I think I think that's only where it applies. But if you look at somebody personally, if you look at, I don't think a legitimate business purpose applies to an individual who's doing something outside of his occupation or outside of his organization. Well, that's not the argument. The argument is that he's doing something within the scope of that organization's purpose and, you know, and the reason for its existence. Um, doing something within the scope of the business, but I, I would, in my opinion, I, I would think that he would have to actually be a part of the organization itself well, I thought he was a committee member just like your defendants were committee members I don't I don't think so but was he was he an SEC member at the time he, he he's a former SEC member I mean so, I, I don't remember when he left but he yeah, was I, certainly a member of the party yeah a member of the party but I I, I, I don't you know I, I want to say that that's part of the the organization itself um, I mean I, I guess there's an argument argument how does that not be part of the organization itself? well in the sense that he doesn't, he's he's not a part of running running the party. There, there are certain officers and there's certain mem there's certain um, you know people who uh, you know committee members who actually make decisions for the party and who actually work for the party. And so he is he's not he was not one of those individuals who worked for or who was on a committee making decisions, helping make decisions for the party. He was outside of that decision making process. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I and, and I, I would, and so I, I would say, you know, I would say when you look at that, when you look at the the meaning of a, of, of of the legitimate business purpose, I, I really don't think that he was he was doing that for legi legi a legitimate business purpose. And and not not just that, but when when you even even if you could say that he was it, that that communication you know possibly could be you know because he was. A member of the party that it you know because that it could it could be uh, um, that there's potential or it's a possibility that it could have been for a business purpose. I, I would submit, and I I think the uh, I think the complaint alleges that because of his intent, his intent wasn't to do it for a business purpose. He had the complaint alleges a malice and, and an ill ill will towards the the plaintiffs, and his intent wasn't to do it for a legitimate business purpose. It was to malign the the uh, the, the plaintiffs. Um, the second point related to electronic communication, I, I know in the in the motion and in the re re reply, it talks about it talks about cause. It talks about defendant not causing the the harassment uh, because he didn't. It, it was mentioned in the reply that he didn't cause it because he didn't send the emails directly to the plaintiffs. However, if if you look at case law and if you look at if you you look at the the model uh, Utah model jury instructions and look at the definition of causation. It's uh, it, the, the definition is that ca cause means that a person's act act or failure to act produce the harm directly 
or set in motion events that produce the harm in a natural and continuous sequence. Um, and the person's act or failure to act could be, could be foreseen by a reasonable person to produce a harm of the same general nature. And so when you look at the definition of causation, he doesn't have to directly email the plaintiffs. He defendant caused the, the harm to, and the harassment to plaintiffs because he set in motion that process. He sent, he, he sent the... the uh, well, well, I guess following up on Mr. Wyatt's argument, one can argue that your clients put themselves in that... I mean, they set it in motion by acting or choosing or, or being elected, if you will, to act as representatives of a group of people. They they essentially said, give me your input. And yeah. here a bunch of people gave them their input. The fact that somebody else prompted them to give input. Yeah. So what, what, what was the real cause here? And in other words, would your, would your clients have received any of these emails if they were not in the positions that they were in? And, and I, I would say no. They, they, they weren't. So the, the particular emails were, were harassing emails. That they were being accused of criminals. They were being accused of criminal conduct. And so those particular emails that they received would what, not. Which email? I mean, by the you mean the people who sent them emails were accusing them of criminal conduct, or you the, mean the email that Mr. Acumen sent? So the 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 emails. So the emails that were sent from the individuals who received defendant's email. Mm -hmm. They emailed they emailed plaintiffs and say that they were criminals and they they uh, they got other you yeah, know, those emails aren't part of this lawsuit, right? No, I, w w well in a sense they are. You're not suing the individual. You're not suing Mr. Acumen sends right. it to to people A, B, and C. Uh -huh. Maybe A, B, and C then send in emails to your clients. You haven't sued A, B, and C. You've right. sued Acumen. So the question is, what does Mr. Acumen's email say? So so the reason the reason why I feel though that those emails are important because that Daryl Acumen caused those emails to be sent to plaintiffs. And if you look at the statute, it says that's it it says the person causes disruption, jamming, or over, overload of an electronic communication system through excessive message traffic or other means. And so because Daryl, because defendant sent a defamatory email to thousands of people, those that, many of those thousands of people, that, that, that email by Daryl Ackman caused those thousands of people or many of them to send emails and jam the plaintiff's email systems and communication systems. How do we know that? I mean, it was a highly publicized issue. How do we know that those people just didn't say, you know what, whoever's in charge of the Central Committee, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. We we know that we know that it was a that we know that he caused that because he in the email in the email that he sent out he had a specific he had a specific button that those recipients could press. And then once they pressed that button, it gave them a it gave them a chance to respond and send out emails to plaintiffs. So the emails that plaintiffs received was directly related to the email that defendants set up because there was a button that they pressed, and it was sent to all these plaintiffs through that button that they pressed to respond to the email and to send a message to the plaintiffs. So it was it was directly related, and that email that Daryl Ackerman sent caused those cause that to happen, cause those those people to send emails to plaintiffs. And so there's a direct, there, there's a direct, um, you know, you, you, plaintiffs can prove easily that, that they received emails from the recipients of defendant's email. Okay. And so, and so based, based on the definition of cause and, and based on the fact that even though he didn't directly send them emails, he did cause those recipients of those emails to send Harassing and and uh, an excessive amount of emails to plaintiffs, and and when you how do you define excessive? Well, they they many of them weren't able to. I, I mean, I, I guess you could find excessive in the fact that they receive much more email than they usually do because of that email that he sent out to the to the point where it some of them couldn't even use their emails because it overloaded their email system so much that they 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 uh, couldn't go through all their emails qu quickly as quickly as they were coming in. And so they, they, they definitely received, you know, 10 times, 20 times more emails than they usually did on, on, a, on a, a regular basis. 
And so, ba based on that, I, I, you know, and, and based on the allegations of the complaint, I, I can definitely say that defendant caused, uh, it caused, you know, per the statute, caused disruption, jamming, and overload of plaintiff's electronic communication systems. Um, to, to the defamation aspect the, uh, of this, so the, what, what defendant has focused on a lot is, what, what defendant has focused on a lot is, is whether or not the, the bylaw was illegal or not. But that's not what plaintiffs are alleging their what, what plaint The main issue that the complaintiffs have is not that defendant said that the bylaw was illegal. It said that they acted criminally and that they acted illegally. Well, that's where I, maybe I'm reading a different email, but I didn't, what I read in the email was the statement that it was illegal, i.e. the bylaw, not that any individual acted illegally. Help me with that. Yeah, I'll help you with that. Let me pull that email up. So with, with, with that, the, uh, and, and, and in the complaint, it, it, it definitely alleges that that defendant accused them of, of criminal conduct. And let me find... Show, you know, yeah, let me, words are important here. Yeah, yeah, let me find that. Yeah, let me find that. Show me the words. Okay. Um, Sorry, let me, I'm just going through it right now. So, so it says in the uh, and, and I think the whole the whole gist of the email I think it's focused on on the the the, the gang of fifty one and, and the plaintiffs are, are of course members of fifty one and it says well, 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 okay let's yeah. let's let's stop with that yeah where I mean I've got to ask you this question at some point yeah where were your clients actually identified. So there, in, in the amended complaint, it, it talks about there, there was a website that Daryl Ackman put up on his website. There, there, was a, there was a list of the Gang of 51 members. And, and in that list, it was on his website, and there was, there's reference to it, I believe, in this email. And, um, and on, on, in that list, it mentions all the members of the Gang of 51, and plaintiffs are in that list of Gang of 51 that, that Daryl Ackman has had on his, and still does, has on his website. Mm -hmm. um, so where, where it where it where it where it, 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 it accuses plaintiffs in the in the second paragraph, the last sentence, it talks about actions and and it's referring to the actions of the the Gang of Fifty One, and it says these actions violate um, the Utah Republican Party platform. That's hardly a criminal offense. And, and it says, which states we support the rule of law and in, and believe in upholding the law of the land. Okay. And so, and part of this whole this email is about is about violations of the law and about violations of the rule of law and the law of the land. And and it also says that because this stunt talking about the the, the gang of fifty one this stunt flounts current election law it constitutes a class B misdemeanor punishable by up to six months of jail and one thousand dollars of fine. So who's gonna? Who's gonna? Who is going to? So of course he has to be referring to the gang fifty one right here, because who else it can't apply? Why? To, I mean, because just, it can't apply. He's just saying the stunt or the bylaw or whatever you want to say but, violates. But it might, but, might be a violation. But it also talks statute. about a punishment of up to six months in jail and a thousand dollar fine and jail time. Who's gonna? The, I mean, they're not being accused of sexual assault. I mean, he's not saying, you know. You know, Jane Doe sexually abused my daughter. Right. How, he's how, saying. He's saying this bylaw 
uh, might violate or violates uh, Section 20 of the Utah State Code. Right. It, and, and what I think is important is that it, it also says that it's punishable by up to six months in jail and a thousand dollar fine. And, and who's well, that? that's the definition of a class B misdemeanor. Right, but but it, it's also it's also pointing to the stunt and the actions and, and later refer it, before it refers to the actions of the the, the gang. Of but does it really accuse any individual of violating the law? Yeah, I, I, the gang of fifty one. I, I think it absolutely. No, it just says the stunts, the the move, the move taken was the adoption of a bylaw. The bylaw. But who who did the stunt though? That that's my the, the gang. Of oh, how many layers back do you need? Do you have to go before you think there really is an allegation, or there really is a a, de a defamatory statement? Well. Well, and it, well, I, th I think the reci I know the recipients of the email thought there was an accusation. Well, that's the, I'm not and sure so, that's the standard. Well, but. well, well, no, but I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I, I, I can see. I can see an accusation towards the gang of fifty one in this email, and I know that the that, that the and, and if and if I can, and if the recipients did, then I, I know a jury can see that there is an accusation against the gang fifty one. And I think I think this is I think this is um, part of the thing is that a lot of the issues that defendant raises. A lot of these things are facts that should be decided to be decided by a jury. And, and again, if, if I can see it, and I know that many of the recipients of the email saw it, then I know a jury can. And, and I think that's one of the important important issues of this is that this is that that you know that this is a fact that needs to be decided by by a uh, the the fact finder in this case. I, I think um, because because it does talk about actions, it talks about actions and the stunt and. And it, you know, and I believe, and, and many other people, uh, the recipients thought it believe thought it related to the Gang 51. So, the only case, other than general standards review cases you cited, uh, was one which uh, addresses this what I'll call the group defamation uh, standard. Uh, the Pratt case is a Nielsen v. Pratt. Uh, Nelson, or Pratt v. Nelson. Yeah. Um, I was having trouble when I read that concluding that it supported your position. Help me. So I think I think I, I, I mentioned that case because it, it talked about the. Um, let me look at here. I mean, in paragraph 49, it says, right. states the general rule. Generally, the group defamation rule precludes defamation suits based solely on statements made referring to groups or classes of people. So that's the general rule. It, it went on to suggest that in that particular case, there was an exception to it. But do you remember why they got there? The, the case? Yeah, how they got to that exception. I... They got to that exception because they said, well, you identified this group in a complaint and, and the fact that it was a judicial proceeding didn't help them there because they, didn't, they then took the complaint and delivered it to every member of the news media nationwide, essentially. And, and the court said that excessive publication took it outside the absolute privilege of judicial proceedings. So they had to get to that point before they could... Uh, get outside the group defamation rules. I'm I, I, trying to figure out how you get there under the Nelson v. Pratt case. Well, I think so. So I think I think the reason words, why how I, do you get outside the general rule? So I and are you referring, referring to um, whether or not plaintiffs were named in the email is that what you were talking about or is that well, that's the, part of it but yeah. uh, I mean, they're just it's a group it's not right it wasn't an allegation against any particular individual right and and I've already indicated to you how I'm struggling with the fact that I'm not even sure that any individual was 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 that there was any statement made that any individual was violating the law but let's let that it was nothing but a group uh, statement and so if the, if Nelson v. Platt or Pratt is Platt, Platt, yeah. whatever it is, yeah. 
uh, Pratt. Pratt v. Nelson says that the general rule is you don't you don't get defamation based on a group statement. Then how do you get outside that? Gotcha. Rule? So I, I think I think the distinguishment is that defendant actually named. So he refers to the group in 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 the in the email, the Gang of Fifty One. But then he and on his website he actually names each member of the Gang of Fifty One. So I think. But he still never. He never alleges that an individual violated right. the law. And, and which I, I mean, your whole basis of it goes to that. I mean, what else is there in the email that you're complaining of? And what else is this not just well, common I, political speak? Well, I, I think I think I think I think he does in the email accuse the Gang of Fifty One of, of violating the law. I, I think it's I, he absolutely does say that in there. Um, that he, if if you look at if you look at the the context of the message. I think he actually absolutely states that they they committed a class B misdemeanor, and because, because no, he of what never they says did. that. He says this stunt it, right? But but somebody but somebody but somebody acts to to make the stunt, and so and who who acted according to Daryl? It, it, it well, was, well, I mean, it, it could be that he's accusing the party. I mean, the, the organization. Well, I. It, that's a possibility, but but because he actually mentions the Gang of Fifty One in the email, I, I think it's very clear on who did the stunt in the email, and it's the Gang of Fifty One. And and because because he made that list in the on his website, many many of the people in in who received those emails knew exactly who he was referring to in this email because uh, because he mentions the Gang. Was that supposed to be a private meeting? I mean, you're saying that the fact that they voted the way they did itself, I mean, it was a secret ballot, or it was a, it was something that, I mean, they, they're elected officials within the context of that organization, and they took a position, which was not a private position, took a public position on a, on a matter that was presented to the group and the fact that how they voted got out, how is that defamatory? Well, the, the defamatory... Did they defamatory. not take that position? Is, well, it, is well, it your position that they did not vote well, that way? Well, I think there's, there's two answers to that. One is that there, some of them absolutely did not vote for it, and, and, uh, and, and the other part is that the, the defamatory aspect of this is that he accused them of, of committing a crime, and I think that is that is the most important. Okay, part. So as we're still striving, we're still. Your your position is that he accused certain individuals of creating of committing a crime. Yes, the gang of fifty one. He of commit. He accused the gang of fifty one of committing a crime, not the not the action. Taken by the by, not that the bylaw itself was a uh, was a violation exactly, but that that some action taken by these individuals was a violation exactly. That the and action it, taken by by voting for this bylaw, he accuses them of of criminal conduct, and the Gang of Fifty One of criminal conduct, and he mentions each individual member of the Gang of Fifty One on his website, which he uh, makes reference to, and so. People and, and 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 this is backed up by what people thought who uh, by what the recipients of the email thought they 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 thought based on the responses that these people made to the plaintiffs those people who received none the email, of which I have in front of me right right but I do I do allege it, it I mean it is alleged in the complaint that they that they and I, I can you know if if this is a summary judgment motion you know we can I, I can get those after like as we discussed. I can get some of those, you know, as affidavits and, and some exhibits of those emails that they that they received, and and they they th those individuals, at, many of them, they 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 believed that according to his email that these people committed a crime, and they knew exactly who these individuals were because defendant had a list of them on his website, and because because he accused them of acting criminally. Um, these individuals, these individual members of the Gang of 51, because he accused them of acting criminally, um, it was defamation. And I know, I know, defendant, I, or I know, defendant has has brought up the the absolute truth and the qualified, you know, privilege uh, doctrine. In terms of absolute truth, it's it's not absolutely true that they that they committed a crime. I mean, if we're looking at it from the standpoint of plaintiffs committing a crime and that that was the accusation of defendant, that's not an absolute truth. Um, and, and also, it wasn't an opinion. It, it, it was stated as fact in his email. 
the other the other the other you know qualified privilege if you look at case law you talk case law if you look at if you look at the model you tell model rules of model jury instructions the the defamation a qualified privilege can be overcome by either actual malice or common law malice and when you look at common law malice common law malice is acting with ill will and hatred towards somebody else and that is exactly what's alleged in the complaint and it mentions emails and other communication that defendant has stated showing ill will and malice towards the towards plaintiffs and and because he he had act common law at least common law malice then qualified privilege does not apply to this and defamation you know would stand and I think the same goes with false light I mean false light he no privilege applies to false light and he actually put you know put plaintiffs in in a false light before the public and before other individuals and he didn't have any justification for doing so and maybe maybe just to just to to recap in terms of the defamation I think I think the key point is that I think whether or not he if there are any questions on whether or not he accused the the plaintiffs of criminal conduct or the game 50 51 if whether what if there are any questions about whether he accused him of criminal conduct I think that really is should be up to a jury for the fact finder to decide because there are have been many there were many other recipients of those emails who thought exactly what I'm stating right now that Daryl Ackerman the defendant accused them of criminal conduct and it affected them in many ways many of them were up for re-election no nobody nobody signs up for political office expecting to be harassed or or defamed and 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 everybody everybody should have I guess I might disagree with that well well if even if even if they expect that they have they have a right to protect themselves from that they have a legal right to protect themselves from defamation if if they can't protect themselves from defamation it's going to open up all sorts of I mean that that would be awful for even work make it worse for politicians and politics if people could go out and defame people left and right I think that'd be awful it open up a really slippery slope and and you know it's so I they plaintiffs definitely have a right to protect themselves from defamation from being accused of criminal conduct and 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 I I I believe strongly and many other people who receive the emails that that is exactly what defendant did was accuse those individuals or in the gang of 51 of criminal conduct okay any other questions your honor not right now okay mr. Weiler so the only response I have is mr. acumen at the time he sent the emails was chairman of the Utah Black Republican Assembly which at some times was recognized by the state central committee as an affiliate and therefore he was given a place on the state central committee as the chairman of that and at some point they the state central committee stopped recognizing them as affiliates so he was a former member I think of the state central committee at the time he sent the email but he was still currently the chairman of the Utah Black Republican Assembly and that organization had an interest to make sure that Republican candidates that reflected their values got on the ballot so that's my only rebuttal unless you have any questions let's go I don't right now thank you so let's talk about procedure as I indicated I'm I I do I think the rule requires me to treat this as a motion for summary judgment and so it also requires me to give all parties the opportunity reasonable opportunity to present all material made that that's pertinent to a rule 56 or summary judgment type motion so how much time do you want to file supplemental two weeks two weeks okay I would probably be derelict if I didn't ask for maybe a week after to do a sir reply if we determine any objection to that all right so we'll expect some sort of a 
submission then by uh, the plaintiffs. Uh, you, you want to go two weeks from today? Let's see what's today. What would that bring us? That would bring us to the 20th, or do you want to go to the end of that week, the 22nd? Or yeah, the 22nd will work. 22nd, so let's go to by Friday, Friday, February 22nd. Mr. Weiler, uh, that would a week would give you then to March 1st. Is that enough time? Yeah, I'll make that work. Okay, so a uh, is a responsive submission and, uh, and potential affidavits uh, submitted by the uh, plaintiff uh, by the 22nd of March, and then a potential reply. Uh, by the first, excuse me, 22nd of February, and then a potential reply by the 1st of March. And then I guess what I'll do at that point, I mean, I, I don't, I guess the question is do we need to schedule a supplemental uh, argument or do you want to, or should we just submit it or should I just wait for both, either of you to at that point? Uh, give me your views of whether you want supplemental argument. Yeah, I, my preference right now would be to submit it. I, I don't think... Um, the well, let's do it this way. Much. Once those pleadings are complete, someone, either or both of you, should then, one of you should file a request to submit, and in that, if you're requesting oral argument, let me know if you're not. In other words, the, uh, a proper request to submit should always say whether you're requesting oral argument or not anyway. So. Uh, either or both of you can initiate that process, okay. uh, and then the other side can always respond and say, no, I'd really like to have oral argument or whatever, but uh, let's do it that way, because otherwise it won't hit my radar screen unless I'm just checking my you know, docket all the time. So once March 1st has come and gone, uh, then somebody file a request to submit and in that indicate whether you wish it to have or not have a supplement argument. I'm, I'm willing to do it either way. Uh, and a little, a little bit's going to depend on what gets submitted as to whether we need to have some further discussion of that or whether we can just, uh, whether I can just factor all of that into my analysis uh, without further argument. Okay, so we'll, so I'll leave it to, I'll leave it to you two to, someone's got to file a request to submit after March 1st and, and give an initial indication of whether you do or don't want to, uh, uh, additional oral, oral argument, okay? okay? All right, anything else we can do today? I think that covers it. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you. We're going to recess.